Okay, well, thank you for coming. Uh, this talk was not announced, so I think this is why we don't have uh, many people. Um, so, uh, I changed uh, the title uh, since the last time I gave, uh, I gave this talk. It is about understanding GNOME internals to administrate desktop Debian machines, although it can, it can apply to desktop Linux machines uh, in the general case. So, why this talk? Um, we know that uh, Debian is quite widespread when you have an environment with a lot of machines. Um, there are good reasons for that. We have uh, automated deployment tools, uh, easy customization, administration tools, and a reliable system to, to give this, to, to use. Um, and workstations are getting more and more a good use case, uh, although Linux is still a minor player on the desktop side, uh, is getting really interesting to administrate um, Linux, uh, Linux desktop machines. So the easy way, um, what many people do is that, okay, they give you, uh, they give you machines with administrative permissions and these, anyway, these Linux users, you know, they are geeks, so they can, they can deal with uh, any problems themselves. Uh, when you have a lot of users, of course, it doesn't scale, and you can't have any kind of decent support. So, uh, a logical way and a secure way to deploy workstations should be uh, really standard workstations with no specific permissions given to users, so it means you need to, ad to do the administration for them. And uh, there, there is a lot of saying about uh, GNOME that it is not easy to administrate. I will show you that it is wrong. And there are, on the contrary, a lot of tools to make it easier for the administrator to, um, well, to delegate permissions, configurations, and whatever. So this should be useful for people who want to administrate their own machine as well because the mechanisms are the same, but of course it is uh, a bit easier. Um, I will not give a complete course uh, over that because it would take several hours, but I will give entry points where you, sh you need to look at when you have a problem or when you need to configure something, and then by digging you will find where is your problem. So, first we'll deal with the base plumbing. Uh, this, this term was co coined not so long ago, but it's really popular. And um, user settings, how to set default settings, monetary settings, login management, password management, networking, very important, and random other stuff that you might want to set up. So um, this, these are the focuses of my talk. Uh, GNOME 2.30 in Squeeze, GNOME 3.4 in Wheezy, and the, the classic GNOME 3.4 also in Wheezy. There are a bit of uh, Debian-specific stuff in that, but it should apply to all these GNOME versions as well. So first plumbing, the most basic plumbing, um, the one which is used by basically every, w every single application in GNOME now is Dbus. What is Dbus? Dbus, uh, at the base, it is a messaging system, a typed messaging system. So you send a message to uh, a recipient uh, and you can pass different uh, data values with our types, which is very important because it is done at the cost of speed, so you should not use Dbus for where speed is critical, but uh, your data is safe because it will not be accepted on the other side if the type do not match. In GNOME, it is not used, of course, as a messaging system uh, per se. It is used as a RPC system, remote procedure call. So what happens? Um, is your, your, yeah, 
So you have two buses. We call these buses because uh, the, the bus is a place that centralizes communication. So messages go always to the bus. So you have a system bus, which is started at boot, and a session bus, which is started right before you log in under the X session. And you can start up system services or session services, which will register a name. So simply, um, you have two ways. So for example, network manager is a daemon which starts at boot and registers a name. And it is accessible through the name org.freedesktop.networkmanager. But it is also possible to automatically start up a service, so the daemon is not here, and it will be started in order to answer to a request. And this holds for both system demons and uh, session demons. So these are the files uh, where uh, we define what binary to spawn if you want to access this service. Dbus implements a basic permissions management, uh, depending on the, on the call you want to make. Uh, you can say this or that group is authorized to make that call. Uh, but it is not wi widely used because we have uh, something much better, which is policy kits. So console kit and policy kits uh, are the other basis for the plumbing. Console kit is a daemon which keeps tracks of users. Uh, it knows really uh, it, it knows which user is logged on from where, on what virtual terminal, and what processes it is using. Although this part <laughs> doesn't work very well. Um, so the CK list sessions command will give you the list of running sessions, and you will see that one of them is active. And the active session has more uh, permissions than other ones. And um, for example, uh, the active session will automatically get uh, specific permissions for a lot of devices. For example, sound devices will automatically get per, uh, read-write permission for the user of the active session. And these are changed dynamically. You switch VT, permissions disappear. So sound is cut. Um, in Jesse, we will replace console kits by uh, system D login D service, uh, which fixes a lot of problems with console kits. Especially, uh, it will know all processes and not just the session, because console kits only knows the process that started the session, uh, while system D, uh, by using C groups, can know the the whole session and it can say this process belongs to this session, so I can give to this process permissions for this session. Policy kit, uh, it's this one is not really a daemon, it's a, it's a mechanism. Uh, well, there is a daemon, but it's, it's more of a mechanism to add permissions to Dbus. And it allows for much more flexible permissions. So it will wrap Dbus calls. So it is not visible from the application itself. The application uses Dbus. And in, instead of the system service, talks to the policy kit wrapper. And the, this wrapper uh, will, well, as the name say, it will apply a policy. So the policy can be defined either by the system, by the administrator. So to, to use the, poli the default policy is in these directories. And it can also look at where, whether the application calling is in an active session. So in, in this case, you will have more permissions. And it will also be able to ask for a password. So for example, you want to do something that requires root privileges. In no way with policy kit, you will have a root process running on your X session, which is generally a, res a recipe for a security disaster. So it will only ask for the root password in the, um, in the user session user using the user policy kit agent. So uh, either the GNOME authentication agent or GNOME shell itself can act as the policy kit agent so, the, so that the, the dialog box uh, is, uh, in looks better in GNOME shell. So 
PolicyKit uh, allows very easily to tune the policy. These are a few selected examples. For example, so by default, you are allowed to, to shut down the session, on, uh, to shut down the machine only if you are the only user. And this is good for desktop machines, but maybe uh, you have machines with multiple users who can access it to SSH, and you don't want that. So you can allow the active user, the user logged on the machine, to always being able to shut it down, regardless of whether other people are using it. So six lines. Uh, or or you, can, you can delegate one Unix group uh, permissions to manipulate the CPU frequency. For example, uh, you don't want you want to run benchmarks, so you don't want the CPU frequency to change. And the user this way can lock the CPU frequency using uh, a panel applet. Or you can delegate permissions uh, with apt daemon and delegate package installation to uh, one user. So you can do group. Uh, user, group, or uh, active-inactive selection. In Class C, it will be much more complicated. Uh, well, not everyone agreed with this change, including myself. Uh, but the advantage uh, is that uh, in addition to PKLA files, it will support JavaScript. Well, currently, it's in replacement, but I don't think we can do without PKLA files. <laughs> uh, so JavaScript uh, will allow you to set permissions not only according to the, to the actions you're requesting, but uh, also to the, to the parameters of this action. So for a good example, here you would, uh, you would allow maybe, so this is the CPU frequency selector, you would be able to say uh, this user can set the frequency to that and that user to another frequency. Well, of course, this is useless, but I mean, you can dig much deeper uh, into permissions uh, management. And also, you can make it a giant mess if you, if you write too many JavaScript files. In GNOME 2.30, and still for a few applications, uh, user settings are defined through the well-known gconf. Uh, gconf works uh, well in not such a complicated way. There is a library. Uh, there is a daemon, which is spawned by dbus. Uh, it used to be spawned by Corba, but since Squeeze, it is spawned by dbus. And the daemon accesses to uh, stores of settings, which are... S which are uh, XML trees, nothing more, nothing less. And the, tr the stores are stacked, so there is an, an ordering, and you can have a read-only store, of that a read-write store, and so you can have uh, defaults, user settings, and you can have another read-only store on top of that, which would be mandatory settings. You cannot override these settings. So th this is only used now by a few, ap a few applications uh, I don't think uh, in Wheezy you, you will need a lot of GCONF tuning for, uh, for administrating machines. Uh, at least we didn't find any setting we wanted to, to change now. Um, this is really Debian specific. Um, the, the schemas are installed in a specific directory and the default settings are generated from the schemas in a specific directory. So th the, the schemas are um, the, the description of which settings you are allowed to set. This is the command to change a setting as a user. This is a command to change the setting as root for all users. should work on all systems. And with Debian, you can change the settings in a package. So a package can set settings for another package with priorities. So it is very flexible if you want to do uh, local packages for your site or for a uh, uh, derivative distribution. And this is a command, the uh, gconf tool minus r will list you all settings that you can set. And there is a the well-known gconf editor, which is uh, well-known for resembling the, the Windows registry, while being much, much easier 
to use regardless. Starting with GNOME 2.32, settings were migrated to Glee settings. Uh, it was not finished in 2.32. It, it is one of the reasons for not losing it for, for squeeze. Uh, in GNOME 3, it is complete. Uh, so Glee settings works entirely differently. Uh, you have the so the, the settings are managed directly by uh, the Glee IO library, which will manage in itself the schemas and overrides so it it doesn't have to you you don't have uh but basically you can already see the default settings without a daemon and you can but and you can plug it and by default it is plugged to uh the deconf daemon you can plug it to a daemon which stores the settings but you can also even, uh, as legacy, use Gconf. For example, some people prefer the, X, the XML store. And apparently it works. We don't recommend that, but uh, there are some cases where you might want that. And Dconf, uh, this one only has uh, binary stores. And so there is the, the system binary store and a user one. It is a specific format, uh, which is called GVDB. Uh, it should be, it should, uh, upstream promise that, it should appear in the GIO interface uh, soon. Uh, the reason for inventing a format, yet another format, which looks a bit like uh, Tokyo Cabinet or, or libraries like that, is to have a typed uh, database exactly like Dbus is typed. So you can match uh, any kind of, uh, of message, in including uh, strings, arrays, arrays of complex data structures in this binary store, which other formats uh, do not allow. Um, and the reason for uh, also for a binary databases st instead of XML is that uh, because of XML, GConf was very slow. So, for example, let's say you want to change uh, uh, the schema is a bit simplified because uh, where it when it is only read-only, the library will directly access the binary store, which is much faster, of course. You only, you only need the daemon to write. So, you can change the setting using, using the g settings command, which is what I recommend uh, to use as user. Um, you have a deconf editor command. Uh, don't come complain if it crashes. It will crash sometimes, <laughs> but it can be useful to to look in the tree for a given data. Just like with gconf, you can tune the g settings in a package, so you can you can ship a g settings override file in the Debian directory, and Deb helper will do the rest for you. And the same holds as with uh, Gconf. You can you can have stacks of settings with different priorities. Uh, um, a few selected examples. So how to change the default background. Uh, and yes, you can also set uh, nice transition backgrounds, uh, which will print a different picture depending on the time of day. Um, you can bring back the the icons, the the desktop directory on the desktop. Um, like in Squeeze, you you ha you would have uh, some random trash you can put on the desktop. Uh, you can change the team uh, with a big uh, drawback, uh, which is the GTK theme has to be has to exist for GTK two and GTK three. Because unfortunately, uh, both versions use the same X setting to read the theme. So unfortunately, there are maybe two or three themes that will actually work uh, for GNOME 3.4 because you still have a pair of uh, GTK2 applications that will look really bad if you don't use a theme that works for both. Um, for example, what we used in the shell to, to set the default, uh, the default extensions and the default applications. For example, we, we enable the, 
the alternate uh, user status menu so that you can shut down the machine <laughs> directly from GNOME Shell without pressing a hidden key. And using dconf, it is a bit more complicated than with dconf to set mandatory settings, um, but you can. You can by setting, uh, by, um, setting a, a system DB. So you, you create another system database, and in this database you set defaults, just like uh, you would otherwise. Well, uh, it's not Lee settings default, it's dconf defaults. Uh, so the, the, the file format is not exactly the same, but it looks very similar. And these defaults will be matched to uh, locks. Uh, sorry. You set the defaults and you set locks together. And when setting a file locks, uh, the list, the um, the settings listed here will not be m modifiable anyway. So it, it, it gives the same results uh, than what you have with dconf, but it's a bit more complicated. And don't forget dconf updates whenever you change the system database. So we are done with user settings. Um, then an important, really important piece of the desktop is the login manager because this is where uh, everything starts. Um, sometimes everything ends if it doesn't work. So, how does it work? It is, uh, as you can see, it, it I often call it uh, a plate of spaghetti because there are a lot of small pieces that talk to each other, and that's GDM since version 2.28. Uh, it, it works really the same in, in GDM 3.4. So you have a daemon. That's, that's a known piece of software. Um, the daemon will spawn slaves. It, one slave for each display it will manage. So at startup it starts one slave. Um, it starts one slave. Uh, the slaves include uh, the safe slave process starts an X server can be useful and a gnome session a min uh, minimal gnome session run as a debian gdm user why why a full session and not just a few selected processes you will ask me because uh, what you need is the same as in a full session you need accessibility you need to read set to read uh, default settings well you need the same demons basically so you start a, m a minimal session with many, many processes blacklisted anyway. And one, instead of starting a panel on uh, Window Manager, you start one process, the greeter. The greeter will contain the actual user interaction. It talks with the slave, and the slave talks to Pam, <laughs> and you can log in. And once you log in, everything like that is killed, Every all of that is killed, and you get your new e X server and the configured session. And you can talk from your session to the GDM daemon through a Dbus interface, which can spawn another slave on another display, because everything is dynamic. So when you close a display, you will be switched to another one. Console kit is used everywhere in the inside that, because uh, it is the daemon which knows where the, the slaves and the displays are on and who is logged on where. So GDM doesn't have to register that information. It is gathered directly from ConsoleKit, uh, which is more reliable for that. So the useful things to do with GDM is configuring it. So as you, can, as you could see, there is the daemon. So there are things you need to configure for the daemon. Um, there are not a lot of, s of things, but you will enable here uh, automatic login, because in this case you don't even want to run the first uh, login session. Uh, vit uh, virtual terminal configuration, you can enable debugging. Uh, you can enable XDMCP, although it is very slippery, so uh, don't do that unless you really know what you are doing. Don't do that on untrusted networks. Really, really, please. 
never. Um, but the real configuration is for stuff that is run inside the, the minimal session. Um, this, of course, differs between GNOME 2 and GNOME 3 because GNOME 2 uses Gconf. So you set Gconf defaults exactly like you would. You, ca you can set them in a package. Uh, this is how we set the, the default background, for example. Um, in GNOME 3, you set, you set G settings default in the, in the G settings formats. And you can also set uh, other defaults in a package. User defaults, uh, which uh, I mean language session on the user icon, the the icon you get from your near your near your name. Uh, they used to be to be stored in your home directory, but uh, there were this uh, this there were some problems with, uh, for example, automatic mounting or encrypted uh, home directories. So now it is stored in a in a system directory, which is managed by the account service uh, service. I did not talk about account service, uh, which is another daemon GDM uses, but it's really uh, it's part of the internals of GDM almost. It used to be part of GDM actually. So once you've logged on, uh, you can you have to manage the user passwords. Uh, this is what the GNOME keyring does. The po the what this software does is storing secrets, uh, user secrets, because it is run with a user session, in AES encrypted files. Uh, so these files are called keyrings, and each keyring comes with its own password. And there is a daemon which accesses the keyrings, and it also does the nifty things like replacing the GNU PG and SSH agents with a GNOME-like prompt. And there is a nice special case, which is the login keyring. Lo the login keyring is a specific keyring which is uses the login password. So when you log in, you automatically unlock the keyring, but it is only unlocked in memory, and on disk you still have safe uh, passwords. So how this works, it is a PAM module, uh, which is called by GDM at the time of login, which will start up a GNOME keyring uh, process, uh, but it is a very, uh, actually it is something like a 20 light function, <laughs> a main, uh, main function, uh, which just keeps the password in memory. And when you log in, the GNOME session starts the daemon and it would just get back the, the password and it can unlock the login keyring. When it has to unlock other keyrings, if if you set it up, if you set them up, you will set them up by hand. By default, everything is in the login keyring. And to unlock another keyring, you will be asked to prompt. User applications can use uh, this demo through uh, either the libgnome keyring library or with uh, org.fudestop.secrets dbus interface. Uh, this interface is supposed to be compatible between KDE and GNOME, although I had, we had noticed a bit of strange things uh, in when running GNOME applications over KDE, while the other way around seems to work. There is also a user interface named Seahorse to manage your to manage your your keyrings. Uh, it's just presents you with the information. It's useful uh, when you, you think, I, I think I stored a password for uh, something like was like that. <laughs> and it will also manage your, uh, your new PG keys. It's, uh, it's a very lightweight uh, interface for new PG keys. And the same PAM module is called when you change your password. So it is important that you change your passwords on, uh, on the machine using PAM, because this will update the login keyring. Uh, this may look like nothing, but when you have a big network, it is often a, ref a reflex to say, okay, uh, password management will be on the server, and users will have to use a web interface or whatever to change the passwords. You can't do that if you want to use the GNOME keyring. Oh, 
Okay, next is networking. Um, a bit complicated too, but extremely useful. GNOME entirely relies on network manager. Um, so, at boot time, the network manager daemon is started, and it talks to directly to the kernel using the netlink interface to set up connections. Um, the network manager daemon reads the. Um, it has a store of connections in this directory. These are text files, simple text files, which describe connections to startup. The default behavior when it doesn't find anything is to start up uh, any interface that is not managed by uh, something else. For example, if you have uh, ETH0 configured in if up down, it will be not be taken over, but otherwise the default is to start the HCP on that. But you can change that. Everything is configurable. Then when the user logs on, it will start a uh, network manager agent, either, either NM applets in GNOME 2.3 or GNOME Classic, or directly GNOME Shell acts as an agent. This agent is responsible for the main user interface, which is, I mean, uh, you click and you say connect to this network, and also password prompts in the same way as the keyring. Uh, for example, uh, the network manager daemon might say, I need secrets for that connection, prompt the user for, the, for these secrets. System connections are always stored here. User connections used to be stored in Gconf, and now they are also stored at the same place as, as system connections, but there is a permission, uh, a minimal permissions uh, management system in Network Manager, so the, the connection is marked as owned by user uh, Joe instead of being for everyone. And only Joe can write connections for user Joe, while you need root permissions to write connections for everyone. And the important thing is also that the agent talks to the keyring daemon to store the secrets securely. So the system connections are started at boot time, and you can control them only if you have appropriate policy kit permissions and you can pre-configure them, which is extremely useful for uh, enterprise uh, setups. User connections, well, you can give or not uh, the ability uh, for the user to start connections. Uh, the default is to allow that. And this way, secrets are stored for user connection secrets are stored in the keyring. But, uh, of course, uh, the, the connection becomes, becomes attached to the user. So if you switch to another user, the connection will be automatically dropped. Some people see this as a feature, some people see this as a bug. And it was, uh, it was solved uh, very recently in Debian by uh, making uh, uh, the behavior depend on your permissions. So if you are a member of the sudo group or of the network, uh, net, uh, net dev group, you have permissions to edit system connections without a password. And the agent detects that and will try to create system connections by default, which will be shared between all users. But if you don't have this permission, instead it will create a user connection, which, be, which will not be shared. Um, there are some complicated setups like system connections, but with the user secrets, uh, this is mostly useful for VPNs and for uh, uh, 802.1x uh, authentication, which means authenticated uh, WPA2 enterprise or authenticated uh, Ethernet. So. Uh, configuration can look like that. Let's say you have a very, a very stupid problem. Uh, only, only a very, uh, very bad company could have such a problem. Say, let's say your DHCP server returns uh, information that is only valid for Windows machines, but you want to plug Linux machines, and so yeah, oh, no problem. I will override the DHCP settings. Yes, but you will also need to connect these machines on outside networks where, well, 
uh, the DHCP server will return information you need. So you can set up two system connections, an external connection, which is some kind of a default. Um, so you define an Ethernet connection, uh, which uses DHCP, method is auto. And you have to specify the MAC address, it is to say, uh, to identify the device, of course. So this, this Ethernet card. And you enable IPv6. But you, s you s set up another connection with the same MAC address. And this one is, uh, you have to write everything from the DHCP server. So you return a different DNS, different DNS search suffixes. And the user will be shown uh, with the two, and you, you also disable IPv6, because usually when you have such a bad setup, <laughs> it won't work. And the user will be presented with both connections and will be able to switch from one to another in one click. This is, uh, of course, a, sim a simple example for a, a very bad case, but it is a real one, fortunately. Uh, other use cases, you can pre-configure a pre-shared key for the Wi-Fi without the user knowing the, the key. Which is not very useful anyway, but uh, it is more useful than giving the shared key to the users. This way they don't have to remember it. Uh, but you can also do 802.1x uh, either with, with a machine certificate, so this way you deploy the certificate on the machine, but the user doesn't give the certificate. But you can also give a user certificate, in which case you configure uh, 802.1x, and the user can select the connection, it is pre-configured, but he will be asked for his personal credentials. All of that while still allowing users to create other connections, like Wi-Fi, to do roaming, etc. So it's very flexible, and if you, if some of you were at the this morning's talk about Network Manager, uh, they are adding a lot of features uh, like uh, bonding support, InfiniBand, which will make all of that very relevant also on servers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, permissions are important. Um, related to networking is the VFS layer, um, so w which is named GVFS in GNOME. Uh, this one works with also with the GIO library, which is part of GLib. Uh, the GIO library accesses the GVFS daemon, which is spawned when needed. So let's say uh, you are accessing only file uh, URLs, so not n no need to access a daemon, and suddenly you ask for something else. Well, uh, the GVFS daemon will do a lot of things. Uh, first of all, it will uh, spawn an explicit request. Uh, this is a huge difference with uh, if some of you knew uh, old versions of GNOME 2, uh, mounting is explicit. So you will ask, for example, uh, a mount for this SMB server, and it will start a specific process uh, to talk to this server. You can, to, you can start as many GVFSD uh, processes as you need. They are started and as, uh, upon request. And the same demon talks to the GDU, GNOME Disk Utility Library, which talks to UDisk daemon, and UDisk is the system daemon responsible for mounting system devices. So let's say you plug uh, a USB device. It is a, a very, uh, <laughs> a very uh, useful uh, case to see. UDev notices the device, says to UDisk, oh, no, you have a device. UDisk notifies libgdu, and one of the applications using it is a uh, GNOME shell or GNOME settings daemon, uh, which has a policy of mounting USB devices when they are plugged. So, oh, mount it. Policy kit, oh, do you have the right to mount this? Yes, you have the right. Mount. And after being mounted, of course, you get a signal that it has been mounted. Um, 
to other interesting things. Uh, you have a Fuse interface for applications that don't understand, uh, that don't use libgio. So it appears in uh, in the .libgfs uh, .libgfs directory. And Nautilus knows how to t how to tell apart applications which do which do know how to access it or those who don't. So, for example, OpenOffice doesn't have uh, GIO support, so Nautilus will start it in uh, by giving it the path to uh, a file in this directory, and it is it will still transparently access uh, the remote files. Uh, LibreOffice, anyway, uh, uses GIO now, so uh, it is not relevant anymore. An example. Um, what did I forget? Yes, how to how to do a mount command uh, from the command line. All of that can be done from the command line. And the last part is the palimpsest uh, user interface, which exposes all the internal uh, functions. So this is, for example, what happens when you have a when you look at the, the partitions, and uh, you can control uh, almost everything uh, on the disk. All operations can be done here, so mounting, formatting, encryption, whatever, uh, tons of features. And last but not least, uh, miscellaneous stuff that you might want to know if you have trouble debugging uh, a system or delegating permissions or whatever. So applications, they uh, use uh, the XDG MIME system, user share applications, and the user counterparts. This includes applications that appear in the menus and applications that can be associated with the MIME type. Uh, this is how you add uh, a, sub a sub menu in your, in your main menu where you can say uh, these application categories will go there. Cups, uh, for printing, you have uh, uh, a, a little, little stuff which is named Cups Package Kit Helper, which complements Cups, uh, because as you know, Cups is a bit rough uh, to use directly because you have to go to the web interface. Uh, the package kit helper allows to control caps through dbus. It doesn't do all the operations you can do on the web interface, but it does already a lot you, because you can configure printers or start them, stop them, print, uh, whatever. <laughs> so, uh, and it is accessed through the configuration interface, which is in Squeeze uh, System Config Printer or in Wheezy uh, GNOME Control Center, and from the the notification the applets that will tell you uh, something is printing, bring, bring you messages, or the printer has no, no more paper. There is a power management interface, uPower, which is accessed directly by the settings daemon uh, to apply the policy. The sound server, which is Pulse Audio, uh, which we intentionally excluded from Squeeze because uh, we felt it was not ready, given the state of sound drivers, but which is here by default in Wheezy. So by, def uh, by default, all mixing interfaces, so this includes uh, what happens uh, when you press uh, this or that, maybe it's better if you do that, this, this interface, uh, is now done through uh, Pulse Audio only. So if you want to disable Pulse Audio, uh, you, uh, you have to, sorry, yeah, uh, you also have to remind that mixing will not work regardless. It's not often a problem if you, if you do that, but uh, Pulse Audio is now really uh, required for mixing. Um, an interesting setting can be to, if you have really a m multiple user machine, you can configure Pulse Audio to mute the sound whenever switching users. So uh, well it's, uh, it's quite funny, you switch users and it doesn't play anymore and you come back, it plays, uh, it resumes playing. Okay, um, final, th final things, I'm almost finished. Um, scripting GNOME, 
uh, which is also something you want to do when you are when you have a lot of users. You also often have uh, sp enterprise specific stuff. It is very easy to integrate uh, your stuff in GNOME. Uh, you can script in Python. Uh, you can script in JavaScript. Um, for why would you want to do that? Well, um, you, we have a real example here: um, an enterprise proxy which only works with Internet Explorer. Uh, a Python code that bypasses it and requires the user a password. The password is stored in the GNOME keyring, so it is only asked once. So this is where you would want to interface with the GNOME keyring and with GTK and with auto starting. Um, you you might have uh, you might want to share data with Windows servers. So you want here to store uh, to look for the the correct path in the Active Directory and ask the user for his password for this search and use the same password for accessing the, the files and put it, etc. etc. So, all in all, the GNOME keyring is the thing we interface with uh, the most uh, <laughs> on our setups because uh, it makes it really easy to manage all the passwords you have I in, a, in a complex uh, enterprise setting. But all of that is nothing compared to the work you have to do for uh, the infrastructure. Uh, configuring one desktop, you put all, these, all the settings I told you, and your machine works fine. Now you want to have a thousand machines. This is different. You need an infrastructure. So this is just uh, a checklist because it always depends on, uh, on what, you have what you want. Uh, there was a very nice talk, by the way, yesterday about free IPA. Uh, it, it gives a good example of what an infrastructure can look like. So you might want a Debian mirror and a custom repository to have specific packages, a custom installation CD using one of the two available solutions in Debian, FAI or Debian installer. You need authentication. Printing, printing is really, doesn't look like it should still be a problem. Printing is th what will cause you the most trouble if you want to, to enable it from Linux machines. Um, why is that? Um, you, can have, uh, you can have a cup server with hundreds of printers, m even thousands of printers now. And if you, if you do that, the user interface will present you all of the printers, and you, you, you don't have easy ways to filter them out. Um, well, so there is no easy solution. So some people put a lot of print servers, so you have one print server for each building, but it's expensive, so you, you put them in virtual machines, but you have then tons of virtual machines with uh, only uh, 10 printers. Uh, Julian Blash, uh, who used to work for us, found a good solution, but uh, it requires patching cups. And patching cups, well, you can, but you will never have your patch accepted by upstream because upstream is Apple. Um, Apple requires copyright assignment. So, thank you, Apple, for keeping cups non working. Um, every time you use the network, Never forget, uh, this was stressed by many other speakers, but never forget about time, synchroniza time synchronization. Uh, out of sync machines will behave erratically in many, many ways. Network file systems, authentication, uh, even printing, I think. Well, everything will fail if you don't have NTP. Um, and you will need most of the time because None of these solution is complete. You will need, uh, need a solution to, to configure stuff directly on your machines. So that means uh, Puppet, bconfig2, or other emerging solution like Salt. Uh, it's very very vibrant community uh, currently. You will need that if you have a lot of machines. And two, <laughs> two things that are not, not handled at all by any tool I've looked at. Root password generation, because you, you don't want to put the same root password for all machines, right? And installation systems don't deal with that. 
Uh, oh yes, yes, you can set up uh, a root password by default and have it transmitted uh, in clear over the network. Good job. So you don't have any solution for root password management and the same holds for encryption keys. If you decide to uh, use uh, uh, DM crypt to, to encrypt your partitions on laptops, the same holds. You don't have an easy way to generate a key and then make the user <laughs> select a password for this key, etc. And that is all. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, they are already uploaded. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will, let me show a uh, place. Oh, I, I think they should. Do they? I, I show you uh, an address where you will find them uh, starting from today, from tomorrow. Okay. Uh, this this address. This is my personal site, and um, it is the same presentation I did in Paris. So the slides are already here, by the way. Other questions? <laughs> well. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, how do that? No. There's ah, yes, the cute, the cute talk, right? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you again.